This video features a brief story on the Italian alchemist and physician Giuseppe Francesco Bori, born in Milan in 1627. He was also considered a messianic prophet and healer. Bori's father was a physician and sent his son to be educated at the Jesuits' college at Rome. Here he soon showed remarkable talent and had no difficulty in acquiring a knowledge of all branches of learning, but was especially attracted to the study of medicine and alchemy. Continuing his medical studies after he left the college, he is said to have led a very loose life for a time, but on settling down he began to practice medicine in Rome and eventually obtained a position in the Pope's household. When he was about 37, he again took up the study of alchemy, and in 1653 became private secretary to the Marquis di Maroli at Rome. From being a free thinker, he developed a strong religious tendency to the extent of fanaticism, and expressed a belief that the secrets of the omnipotent and of nature had been revealed to him. He began to deliver lectures questioning the supremacy of the Pope, and claimed that the mysteries of faith were derived from the principles of alchemy. He soon had to quit Rome, and first went to Innsbruck, leaving there for Milan with the intention of establishing a new religion. Here he frequently preached his doctrines and found many followers whom he told that he had received from the archangel Michael a heavenly sword, upon the hilt of which were engraved the names of the seven celestial intelligences. In their enthusiasm, he and his followers even attempted to take possession of Milan, but their plot was discovered, and Bori escaped to Switzerland. An order was obtained for his arrest through the Inquisition, and a reward of 35,000 francs was offered to anyone who would deliver him up. Meanwhile, he was tried in his absence and condemned to death as a heretic and sorcerer, his effigy being burned in Rome by the common hangman in 1661. For a time, Bori lived in Strasbourg, and then journeyed north to Amsterdam, where he established himself in a fine house and assumed the title of Excellency. Here he practiced medicine with considerable success, and visited his wealthy patients with great pomp, riding in a gilded coach. Meanwhile, he continued to carry on operations as an alchemist. In the latter capacity, he succeeded in obtaining 200,000 florins from a rich merchant on the pretext that he was on the verge of discovering the elixir of life. As this did not mature and he could not repay the loan, he suddenly left one night for Hamburg where at that time Christina, the ex-queen of Sweden, was living. He knew that she was interested in alchemy, and he hoped to obtain her patronage in pursuing his quest of the Philosopher's Stone. But being warned that Hamburg was unsafe for him, he journeyed on to Copenhagen to seek the protection of Frederick III, King of Denmark, who was also a believer in the art. The king, being in want of money, agreed to provide Bori with the means to carry on his experiments and took a great interest in his plan of operations. Bori set to work, and though delay after delay occurred in his efforts to fulfill his promise to produce gold, he managed to ingratiate himself with the king, and by making himself useful to the monarch in other ways, he gained his good opinion. 
He thus spent six years at the Danish court, and on the death of the king in 1670, he set off to travel again. He first went to Saxony, but fearing the emissaries of the Inquisition, he decided to proceed to Constantinople, where he thought he would be out of reach of the papal authorities. Just at this time, Leopold I, Emperor of Austria, was suffering from a mysterious illness, which greatly puzzled his physicians. According to a story related by Roxel the historian, one day while the monarch was in consultation with the papal nuncio concerning an insurrection which had broken out in Hungary, a despatch arrived containing a list of the persons implicated, and among them appeared the name of Francesco Bori. As the name was read out by the secretary, the nuncio started and exclaimed, Bori, have him arrested at once, your majesty. He is a most dangerous man, and has contrived to escape from the avenging arm of the holy office. Within a few hours, a Captain Scotty was dispatched on a special mission to Goldingen to arrest him. As it happened, Bori had arrived at Goldingen on the Silesian frontier on April 10th and was compelled to reveal his real name when, being suspected of being connected with the conspiracy, he was arrested. Thus his name was included in the list of suspects sent to Vienna. On Captain Scotty's arrival, Bori was handed over to him as a prisoner, and traveling in a carriage with an escort of cavalry, the party at once set out for Vienna. Scotty, being an Italian, treated his captive with every consideration, and on the journey told Bordy that he was suspected of being concerned in the conspiracy, and that he had the papal nuncio among his opponents. Then I realized the real cause of my arrest, said Bordy. Scotty also told him of the emperor's mysterious illness, and remarked it was now supposed to be due to secret poisoning. Bordy declared that if this was the case, he could readily discover the presence of a poison, should one exist, and implored Scotty to inform the emperor that if he really suspected poisoning, he could find the cause. Scotty promised to comply with his request. On their arrival in Vienna on April 28th, Bori was taken to the Swan Inn and lodged in a room which was guarded by soldiers. Tired and wearied by the journey, he at once threw himself on the bed and fell asleep, but he was aroused during the night by the door being opened. A man wrapped in a cloak and carrying a lantern entered, and this midnight visitor Bori recognized as Captain Scotty. Make haste and get ready, said the captain in a low voice. The emperor wishes to see you for your reputation as a physician is known to him. His Majesty trusts you, but I was compelled to wait till night, as he does not wish this visit to be known. In a few minutes the two men were walking through the dark and silent streets toward the palace. When they arrived, Scotty handed his prisoner over to a chamberlain, who conducted him to the imperial antechamber and bade him be seated. In a few minutes a gentleman of the bedchamber entered and made a sign to Bori to follow him. They passed through several apartments until they came to a velvet-covered door, which the gentleman opened, and drawing back a heavy portiere, he beckoned Bori to enter. The emperor's cabinet was a gloomy room, lighted by a few candles, 
which shed but a dim glow on the pictures which covered the walls. Seated in an armchair near the table, a little man was discernible, wrapped in a dressing gown of green silk, and wearing a cap with a shade for his eyes. His feet, with which he was making impatient movements, rested on a stool. His face was livid and his cheeks shrunken. Bori took a step forward and bowed, and the little man looked up. Are you Francesco Bori? he asked, in a trembling voice. At your majesty's service, replied Bori. I am sorry to see you here as a prisoner, but you are not one at present, said the emperor. Had I not been arrested, I should not have had the happiness of seeing your majesty rejoined Bori. I hear much that is satisfactory about your learning, although in another respect you are said to be a dangerous man. Why do you trouble yourself with religious affairs? Leave them to the clergy. I hear that you now devote yourself to medicine. What have you heard about my condition? Nothing beyond the supposition that your majesty is being poisoned, replied Bori, but that I may be able to express my views on the subject, your majesty's physician must tell me of your symptoms, and then I shall be able to speak with certainty. A messenger was at once sent for the physician. Bori, meanwhile, was struck with the emperor's grey and wasted appearance, and rising from his chair he took a survey of the room, examining every ornament and object and smelling them with suspicion. The emperor followed his movements with inquiring eyes. Well, Bori, he sighed at length, what do you think? I think that almost certainly your majesty is being poisoned, said Bori decisively. Holy Mother, have mercy on me, cried the emperor. I must first speak with your physician, but I think I can promise your majesty's recovery with equal certainty, for there is still time. How do you come to this conclusion of poison? My friends dine with me and eat the same food. Do you notice anything on my body? It is not so much your majesty's body as the atmosphere of your room that is poisoned, observed Bori. How can you tell when I feel nothing of it? Your majesty is too accustomed to the poisonous exhalation to notice it. And whence comes the exhalation? asked the emperor. Bori rose, and taking the candelabra that lighted the room, placed them all on the table. See the exhalation that rises from the candles, he exclaimed. Do you not notice the peculiar color of the flame? At this moment the chamberlain entered the room, and the emperor asked him if he noticed the smoke arising from the candles, and he replied that he did. The physician then arrived. You have come at the right moment, said the emperor. It is asserted that the air of my room is poisoned. Give me the report of my illness. The emperor passed the document to Bori, who glanced quickly at it and nodded his head. Do you not perceive the curious smell in the room and the fine quickly ascending vapor from the burning candles? Bori asked the doctor. It would be interesting to know if the same candles are used in the empress's apartments. The chamberlain at once brought two lighted candles from the empress's chamber and placed them on the table beside the suspected ones. The former burned clear and quietly, while the latter had a ruddy flame and emitted a thin vapor and occasionally sparks flashed from the wicks. There is the cause of your sickness, exclaimed Bori, as he laid his hand on the candelabrum. And I will prove to your majesty that these are impregnated with a subtle poison. 
Extinguishing the suspected candles, Bori removed all the wax from the wicks, and shredding the wick of one, asked that it should be mixed with some meat and given to a dog. The turnspit dog was brought and shut up in a cupboard with the dish of meat. Meanwhile the emperor was removed to another apartment, and Bori and the physician proceeded to the palace pharmacy to prepare an antidote for him. Here also Bori tested the suspected candle wick, and found, as he had thought, that it was impregnated with arsenic. He had left instructions that he was to be called as soon as the dog got restless, but the animal was found to be dead by the time he returned to the emperor's cabinet. The antidote prepared by Bori soon produced a beneficial effect on the emperor, and his health improved so rapidly that within three weeks he was able to go out again. The record of Bori's examination of the candles is interesting and shows that he was a sound chemist. He examined the whole of the suspected materials and weighed them. The weight of the candles was twenty-four pounds, and of the wicks three and a half pounds, from which, by comparison with uncontaminated candles, he estimated that nearly two and three-quarter pounds of arsenic had been employed to impregnate them. For a short time the emperor appears to have treated Bori well, and he dined at the imperial table but the hatred of the clerical party toward him was increased when they saw him thus favored. On June 14, 1670, the emperor, now quite restored to health, summoned Bori to his cabinet and thanked him fervently for his services, but added he was sorry that in the matter of religion he had gone astray. The Pope will appoint a commission he continued, and I have obtained a guarantee from the papal nuncio that in no case shall anything be done against your body or your life. Further, he promised Bori a pension of two hundred ducats a year as an award for his services. He was then handed over to the clerical authorities, and on the following day was sent under an escort to Rome. He was lodged in the prison of the Inquisition until he consented to make a public recantation of his heresies, which he did before great crowds of people, on October 27, 1672. This act saved his life, but he was condemned to perpetual imprisonment. It is stated that through the intervention of the Duc d'Estray, whom he had cured of a disease which baffled all his physicians, he was transferred to the castle of St. Angelo, where he was allowed more freedom, and also permitted to pursue his studies in alchemy. Here he remained in a cell for twenty-three years, carrying on his work, and writing a book dealing with the Rosicrucian philosophy, which was printed in Cologne. Through the influence of C Queen Christina, who was allowed to visit him, he received considerable indulgence, and was permitted to have apparatus in his cell so that he could carry on his experiments. She also provided him with money and encouraged him to continue his researches in the hope that he would at last find the great secret. Bori lived to the age of eighty, and died in the castle of St. Angelo, where the cell in which he lived and carried on his work is still shown. Thank you for watching. Please like and share this video, hit the subscribe button and notification bell, and feel free to ask me any question in the comments section below. Due to the sacred nature of these videos, I would prefer to keep them ad-free. Please help me to do that by clicking the Patreon link 
in the description box below and make a donation to this channel. Or buy me a coffee with the Kofi tip jar link. PayPal is accepted. Every dollar counts. Thank you for your support.